So good afternoon. It's good to see you all here. So if you've seen any of my preceding talks or previous talks, this one's not funny. This is just information. <laughs> There's not a lot of jokes I can tell about small eye beetles, I suppose. So I was originally supposed to speak to you this afternoon about bee diseases and pests, and now I'm going to just speak to you about a bee pest. And the reason for that is probably many of you have heard that small high beetles have been found in Italy recently. So I did my PhD with small high beetles in South Africa. I think I got there in 2001 and finished in 2004. And so small high beetles were a very big issue at the time. I did a lot of work with them, published a lot of papers. And when the state of Florida, where I currently reside, was looking for a bee professor to take the position of the one who had retired, they had two things that were very interesting, uh, interesting to them, African bees, because we had African bees in Florida, and secondly, small hive beetles. So I was able to kind of fill that niche uniquely. I went to Africa and studied African bees while studying small hive beetles. So I was uniquely uh, suited for that job, as it were. The issue is, though, is since I've been there in, in 2006, increasingly beekeepers worry less about small hive beetles. And I don't know if that's a good thing that you want to hear or a bad thing that you want to hear, but I know that almost every new bee disease and pest is preceded by a whirlwind of this is the one that's going to take our colonies out. But I will submit to you that as, in my travels around the world, small high beetle problems are worse in Florida than anywhere else I've seen on the planet, and beekeepers don't think twice about them anymore. So hopefully that will give you a little bit of comfort before I get to the end of this presentation. I don't want to suggest that they're innocuous. Small high beetles are a problem. We still use, lose colonies and even apiaries sometimes to small high beetles. But it's nothing near uh, the, the paranoia and the pandemonium that accompanied them as they moved into the United States from Africa. So that's what this talk is principally about. I will share with you, though, that we have not done a lot of beetle work in the past five years in my lab because I try to do what my beekeepers feel is important and they haven't really been putting a lot of emphasis on small hive beetles so I've instead focused most of my work on pesticide impacts on bees if you saw that talk you'll, you'll know why and varroa mites but with that said I am going to tell you what I know about beetles or at least a little bit about what I know about beetles again I want to echo the fact that this has been sponsored by BDI so thank you for that and we'll start here at the beginning if you wanted a, a catchy title we could call it closing in on an international most wanted this is a picture I took of the small high beetle was when I was a graduate student in Grahamstown, South Africa. This is actually a life-size image of the small high beetle. <laughs> you can see why people are so concerned about this thing. No, in reality, the reason we call it small high beetle is because there are larger beetles that get into colonies. And that name was given first. So there was a large hive beetle. So naturally, a smaller beetle that showed up in the colony had to be a small hive beetle. Large hive beetles, despite what goes on in the literature, do not belong to one species. There is no species of large hive beetle. Basically, that is a name to describe any scarab beetle that shows up in a colony. So Africa has its assortment of scarab beetles that show up in colonies. Florida has its assortment of scarab beetles that show up in colonies, and we refer to all of these as large hive beetles, but they're not the same critter. And so scarab beetles will go in there because they principally like nectar or fermenting things in pollen. You'll oftentimes see them, in fact, on flowers collecting pollen or nectar. So it's no surprise that they'll show up in our colonies. I say all of that to say the one that we call the small hive beetle is, in fact, just one species. At least we believe it is. And it's Athena tumida. So I'm sure you're writing that down. Don't ask me to spell it because I can't spell I should be able to spell this, though, because I've worked with it a long time. This particular beetle belongs to a family of beetles called nitidulids, and nitidulids all have some fairly common characteristics. They have clubbed antenna, like what you can see here. They're usually covered in, a, in an exoskeleton that goes almost all around their, their body, this, this kind of shield on the top of their backs. In fact, small hive beetles can completely retract their head and their antenna and their legs fully up under this hard back, almost like a turtle. So I'll talk more about that momentarily. But this is um, a beetle. This particular beetle happens to be a female. Um, the reason I know that is because I asked her when I took her picture. <laughs> no. In reality, when you, when you get a, an adult small hive beetle, if you squeeze her abdomen, 
one of three things will happen. A big long thing will shoot out, or a teeny tiny thing will shoot out, or you'll squeeze too hard and she'll blow up. <laughs> All right. Assuming you didn't do the third choice, one of the front two things is something that could happen. So which one is the male? The one with the long thing. The one with the long thing. Okay. That's wrong. It was a trick question. I, I like to ask trick questions to audiences. All right. So the female actually has an appendage called an ovipositor, egg-laying machine. So she'll use that. She'll push it out of her body, and she can pivot it around like a machine gun, laying eggs just wherever she wants to, and cracks her crevices. Males have a very small phallus that shows, <laughs> trying to disguise it again for my daughter, that, that, that will come out, and there'll be a, a small piece of... Um, the exoskeleton that goes over the top of it. It's, if you're squeezing really hard and nothing's happening, it's probably a male. That's the general rule of thumb. Because females typically push out that ovipositor pretty easily. And so you ask why is this even important? Because when you work with a critter, you have to be able to sex it in order to know what you're doing. So I'm really good at telling the sex without killing them so that I can continue to use them in the studies. And I can see the beginning of the ovipositor starting to poke out here on the bottom of the, the beetle. The reason I'm showing this next slide is because there are other nitidulids that have been found in honeybee colonies in America. And that's important because just because you see a beetle in a colony doesn't mean that you have the small hive beetle and the world's going to end. For example, this is another nitidulid, Lobiopa insularis, and it's the same size, the same shape, not quite the same color pattern as the small hive beetle. And it's interesting because when I was extremely naive about small hive beetles, very fresh with studying them, I found colonies with hundreds or thousands of these, and I was sexing them and trying to get them to perform in my studies, and I couldn't because I had the wrong species. Now this one here is another nitidulid that has orange patches on its back. That's much easier to distinguish from small hive beetles. But needless to say, there's lots of things that can show up in colonies. There's other species that are even similar in color and appearance to small hive beetles. So I say that to say, don't panic just because you see one. Make sure you call your bee inspector and, and let them have a look. So, years and years ago, I made a distribution map of where small hive beetles were. If you read the literature on small hive beetles, generally it is believed that they are distributed south of the Sahara. So I regularly found colonies in South Africa that had small hive beetles. In fact, most colonies I went into had low populations of beetles. And if you look at the literature, many of these countries here report having small hive beetles in colonies as well. The countries that are in white just don't have robust apiary programs. The beetles are probably there. There's just no one there to report it. It's been found in Egypt, but that was a spot find and maybe even a questionable find, and it's not been found since is my understanding. So this is on the map just as a, for what it's worth. Of course, they're in the United States. And in the early 2000s, they were found in Australia as well. Now, I wouldn't have shifted my presentation to talk to you about small hive beetles had they not been found recently in Europe. And so they have been found in Italy, and I'm getting lots of reports back from them regularly. In fact, I'm going there in January to, to lecture to their beekeepers about beetles. And I believe they've been found in 30 or 40 plus apiaries at this point. Multiple colonies, they're here. You know, I know that they're working hard to destroy bees, to try to eradicate them, but all the wild bees and feral bees in the areas probably also have small hive beetles. I'm curious to see how that works out for them. But I will say, Italy, especially southern Italy, seems like a very good place climatically for small hive beetles. It's very conducive to what they're accustomed to. All right, so one of the benefits of doing, at least for me, a PhD in the southern hemisphere is when it was winter in the southern hemisphere, it was summer in the northern hemisphere, and I could just go home and repeat the same studies I had just done in South Africa. So basically I kept going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth doing the same studies in both locations to see how the U.S. bees, the, the, the formerly European U.S. bees, lived with small hive beetles compared to how the African bee, or at least the bee that I was working with in South Africa, was living with small hive beetle. And so what I did is I reared up thousands of beetles. I'm really good at producing beetles. If you want some, let me know. I can make it happen for you. So we produced thousands and thousands and thousands of these little critters. 
And we would have African colonies that we would put beetles into to try to look for impacts and European colonies. And I could show you the stats and the graphs and the, the significance values. Or I could just use arrows. And anywhere an arrow goes down, that is something that small hive beetles impacted. For example, we had little nucleus colonies, about five frame nukes of African bees, and we had put almost 1,500 beetles in, and we could not get anything to happen. They wouldn't crash. They weren't losing honey or brood or adult bees. The only thing that went down was the amount of pollen they had stored in the nest. Whereas we do the same study with European bee colonies, and everything started going down. So clearly there was evidence that bees are diverting uh, behavioral efforts towards dealing with these beetles in lieu of doing what they should ordinarily be doing. So we'll talk more about this as we progress. So this is the life cycle of a beetle, a, a pretty good chart put together of an adult beetle. She will lay eggs in cracks and crevices around the nest, as I've shared earlier. And out of these eggs will come larvae, and the larvae are eating machines. They go through the colony and eat pollen, possibly nectar, bees, bee brood, etc. And anything that they eat that has sugar in it ultimately ferments. And so obviously honey has sugar in it, but so do baby bee guts. And so everything just turns into a frothy, slimy, disgusting, wet mess when beetles really start going through the colony really well. So once these larvae have finished eating, and that can take from about seven days if they're feeding on bee brood, upwards to two to three weeks depending on the quality of diet. Once they finish doing that, they will come out of the colony, usually in the evenings, and go into the ground to pupate. All right, so they come out usually in the evenings and into the ground to pupate. And that's what's happening here. We dug up a pupil small hive beetle. And, and I think I shared with you the other day, if you were making a horror film about insects, this would be the one that you chose. I mean, it looks like a vampire with a cape. I mean, it's got everything you want in a, in a scary insect. You can actually sex pupil small hive beetles as well. I know it's hard to see, but this one's a male. And because of the reason I know that is because it's missing an appendage that would be here otherwise. If you want to know how to sex small hive beetles, the IBRA just put out a book called the Coloss Bee Book that has great diagrams on how to sex small hive beetles. So you can buy it and take it home and practice all you want to. Of course, you don't have beetles, so maybe you can't practice, but you can think about practicing had you had beetles. So this stage can last a couple of weeks, maybe two to four weeks, depending on the air temperature, etc. Whether or not they overwinter in the ground as, as pupae is debated right now. I've never seen compelling data to suggest that they do, but we know that they can overwinter in colonies as adults. So usually I'm going to try to head off a question that I get a lot about beetle larvae. A lot of people will say, well, just put your bee colonies on big cement slabs so that larvae can't get to soil. Well, I always have to tell a story to illustrate how far these guys crawl before they get to soil. The lab where I worked at Rhodes University was on the second floor of the zoology building. And, one, and, and I had a closet in the lab where I reared beetles because they didn't want me in the rest of the lab. And one morning I got to the office and walked in the lobby and I saw small high beetle larvae walking out the door. So I, got, I went up the steps and I saw small high beetle larvae walking down the steps. And I went onto the floor where I was, my lab was and I saw small high beetle larvae absolutely everywhere. And I went to the closet where I was rearing them and there was a jailbreak. There was just a mass exodus <laughs> of beetle larvae leaving the lab, going down the hall, down the steps, out the foyer and out the front door of the building to get to soil. So yes, you can probably put them on cement slabs and stop this. It would just have to be London. Right? So they will go quite a great distance. Another fun rearing story, and then I'll, I'll move on to the knowledge part of this lecture, is that every morning, because I was not very good, I was good at producing beetles, but not good at containing them. All right? So every morning when I would go to the office, there'd be beetles flying everywhere, adult beetles, in the room, in the, in the rearing room. So I had an aspirator. Do you know what those are? A little plastic vial with a big plastic tube with a metal tube on the other end, and you point the metal tube, it suck, and it sucks the insect up into the tube, right? So I spent about an hour collecting adult beetles, aspirating them from the walls. Well, one day I did this at the end of the day, and I plugged the tip of the tube so the beetles couldn't come out, and I put my aspirator down, and I came back the next morning and was ready to collect more beetles, and I put the tube in my mouth, and I went, <gasps> and sucked in like 30 beetles. Now, 
I've been told as a scientist you should eat what you study at least once. Well, I count that as about 30 different times. So I've, I've eaten enough for me and you. What happened is I plugged the tube that they come out of, but the pheromones coming out of the sucking end called the beetles flying in the room into the end and the sucking end. I should have plugged both ends. I learned the first time not to do that again. But the point is, is that these, these things are fun to work with and slimy and stinky all at the same time. All right, so this can take as few as four weeks, generally, as little as four weeks. But I've also seen it take five to seven, depending on conditions, etc. So let's talk a bit about this oviposition. Here I have a picture of a capped brood cell that the female beetle has bitten a small hole in the capping. She has backed her rear end up to that hole and stuck in her ovipositor and laid eggs on the bee developing inside. So that's the bee prepupa. When I remove the capping, you can see the eggs oviposited on the prepupa. The result of this behavior produces this. Now those are all beetle larvae. There are no bee remains there anymore. What used to be bees is all that slimy stuff. So the beetle larvae have emerged from those eggs and then gone through and consumed everything they could get their little mouths on. And once they do this, again, they go into the soil to pupate. So here's some beetle larvae on brood. It's debated, again, but I'm just going to go with the literature. They suggest that there, there are yeast associated with their feces that cause these sugary products to ferment. So you can see the honey bleeding out of the, col out of the combs. And I have seen it so bad, in fact, that the honey bleeds out of the joints of the colonies. Now, this was an intense infestation where beetle larvae were absolutely everywhere, and the entire apiary was collapsing. Just every colony looked like this. So it was a pretty intense problem happening. And one of the first things that I, I regularly got asked when I was a graduate student, well, Jamie, you know nidodulids, this family to which small hive beetles belong, most of them eat and reproduce in rotten fruit and dead animals. So maybe you ought to see if small hive beetles can reproduce on rotten fruit. So I tried that. These are kai apples, a, a, a type of fruit that they have in South Africa. And I put adult beetles on kai apples and 14 days later I had larvae that I put on the soil that pupated and came out as adults. So I was able to get them to pupate on fruit and subsequent to that other people have been able to get them to reproduce uh, on fruit. I will say though the amount of offspring that they will produce on fruit compared to the amount of offspring that they will produce in colonies is not even close. And I also will note that this could be an artifact of lab work. I could put you in a plastic container and feed you cardboard and I bet you'd eat it <laughs> after a few days. And so this could be just an artifact of forcing beetles to do something where they have no other options. So I've yet to see a conclusive field study that suggests that beetles reproduce on fruit in the wild or even are found on fruit. But I want to point out if, if there's a colony around, that's where they'd much prefer to be. They do much better on colonies. So then the next question is maybe, Jamie, they're limited to soil. Because if you think about the United States, they were really bad in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina, southeastern states, but not so much in the northern half of the country. And maybe they said they're soil limited. Maybe they like sandy soils. Maybe they pupate exclusively in sandy soils. So I looked at different soil types represented here. I did different soil moistures and packness, and the only thing that mattered seemed to be soil moisture. They would burrow into concrete as long as it's wet. They were really good at getting down into it. But dry soil, they would spin around the top of the soil until they died. They'd never go down into the soil to pupate. So as long as the soil was moist, we were able to get them into anything as packed as we could make it. So it doesn't seem to be soil type so much as soil moisture. Of course, small high beetles are unlike varroa mites in a lot of ways. Varroa mites move because bees drift between colonies or because we exchange frames between hives. But small hive beetles have wings. They only need to be introduced to a place and they can do the rest on their own. So you probably know that in the United States we have a massive migratory beekeeping industry. We have 2.6 million honeybee colonies in the U.S. and 1.7 million of those, two-thirds of them alone, go out to California to pollinate almonds. The vast majority of our bees move. So I want you to think about that. 60% of all the honeybee colonies in the United States convene in California every February. So it's, real e it's like a brothel. It's real easy to exchange diseases 
right? When one colony has it, they all have it because there's a heck of a lot of mixing going on, right? And so we see that. So, of course, beetles um, move because we move them, but they also fly. There are some questions about their ability to move with swarms. When I would cause colonies to swarm in South Africa, I would regularly see beetles leaving the nest with them. I would capture the swarm hanging in a tree and dissect the swarm and find beetles in it. And then when I would, you know, hive swarms, I would see beetles going in with a swarm. So we have a lot of data to suggest that they may also migrate with swarms. That still needs to be shown conclusively, but we've got some good anecdotal support for that idea. And of course you know what absconding is, that's when a colony just completely leaves. A swarm is when a hive reproduces, half stays and half leaves roughly, but an absconding colony everybody leaves. And incidentally, that is the response of African bees to high populations of small hive beetles. They just leave. They just go. Now in the U.S. we breed bees and 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 breed bees, so much so that we try to take out their defensiveness and we make them sit in their colony and try to weather any storm that comes their way. They just sit there and die. So they just sit there and 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 sit there until it's too late. So our colonies are very hard to cause to swarm with beetles, whereas African bees just left. In fact, to do research on African bees in South Africa was hard because I had to set up twice as many colonies as I needed to do the study because I, would, I knew half of them were going to leave before the study was over just because of the experimental manipulation. So they can move. You know, they're in Italy. It's going to be hard to stop them unless people eradicate them. Good, we're, and the humans are so good at eradicating things. I will spend a little bit of time talking about some things that I find pretty fascinating. A colleague of mine, a German colleague of mine, Peter Neumann, so I was a PhD student in South Africa and he was a postdoc in South Africa in the same lab. And when I got there, he was working on this idea of social confinement, where small high beetles would go into a colony and then bees would push them towards cracks and crevices and then bees would station guards at these cracks or crevices to keep the beetles confined to these positions in the nest, right? So it's almost like they were being put in jail and, and bee jailers were there watching it. And that's what you see here. Two bees behind a propolis wall. There's a beetle that's been ushered in and these two bees are standing guard over this beetle. Every time the beetle comes to the edge of that prison, the bee will ag aggressively address that beetle and drive that beetle further back into that prison. This is a picture I took of an observation hive. So it's very important that you appreciate what's happening here. There is a sheet of glass right here. And this is the top bar of a frame. So there's a frame up here, a frame down here, and the distance between the top bar of the frame and the sheet of glass is only big enough for small hive beetles to go into, but not bees. So what has happened is the bees have corralled the beetles into this position and then they've stationed guards along the top of this and the bottom of this to kind of keep the beetles suspended in this area. Again, along with this confinement behavior. And incidentally, these are European bees in my grandfather's dairy barn in an observation hive in Georgia. So this behavior doesn't seem to be unique to African bees. So I spent a lot of time studying this when I was a PhD student following on the steps of Peter Neumann, who's at, who's at the University of Bern now. And I want to explain a few things going on here. The problem with observation hives is they always leave that question, what if? You know, you're doing all of this, but it's a glass beehive in a very artificial situation. Maybe this isn't a real behavior. But we discussed, I forget how many days we've been doing this now. This is the third day, am I right? Is it Saturday? We discussed two days ago in honeybee biology that honeybees subscribe to temporal polyethism, right? age-related division of labor. So if this is a real, real behavior. This imprisoning behavior is a real behavior. Bees should only do it at a certain age in their life. They'd graduate into that position, do it, and graduate out of that position. Right? So I actually looked at that. I would mark bees with these white or yellow discs with numbers on them, etc. As soon as they emerge from the combs, I would follow them every day of their life and catalog when they showed up at these beetle prisons, how long they spent at these beetle prisons, and then how old they were when they moved away from these beetle prisons. 
And what I found with Cape honeybees and European bees, these in Georgia and these in South Africa, was this. Cape honeybees were about 20 and a half days old when they showed up at these prison sites, and they spent about a day and a half there before moving on to their next task. European honeybees, on the other hand, were about 18 and a half days old and spent two and a half days there. Biologically, this could be irrelevant, but I would ask you, what should bees be doing when they're this age? Transitioning from the hive to the field, right? This is the beginning of that orientation flight foraging stage. So when we look back on these data, which I think I'm getting to, it's much further back than I'd hoped, <laughs> When we look at average flight activity significantly decreasing in European colonies, you know, we developed hypotheses that we were never able to test again because people don't care about beetles much in the U.S. anymore, that possibly bees are responding to these beetles and it's causing bees that should otherwise be out foraging to divert their attention to addressing beetles. Again, that needs to be looked at further. That's just a supposition. But I will point out that we're seeing some very interesting things happening at these prison sites. Now, that leads me to the next thing. This was something I worked on and published when I was a PhD student. When I would watch these interactions between bees and beetles, about 90% of the time the beetles would come to the edge of the prison, antenate with the bees, rub their antenna on the bees, and the bees would aggressively attack those beetles and drive them back down into the prisons. But about 10% of the time, you'd get this really strange interaction where it looked as if there was food exchange happening between these two individuals. In fact, if you see bees feeding other bees, this is kind of what it looks like, except it should be a bee here. So I had hypothesized that it's possible that the beetles are able to trick the bees into feeding them. So I developed a test to look at this, and sure enough, what happens is the beetles come up to the edge of the prison and rub the bees' mandibles, and that causes the bees to snap and begin regurgitating honey. The beetle just sits there and eats the honey, and when he or she's done, she goes back down into the prison site, waiting to get hungry again. And we see this over and over and over. So my supervisor had some colleagues, uh, Gerald Kasperger, who came and took a good video of this for us. This is that same observation hive, but instead of looking at the face of the observation hive, you're looking down the top bar of the observation hive. The sheet of glass is right here. The prison's here, and this beetle has come up to the edge, and you can see clearly how her antenna are engaged on the bee's mandibles, and the bee antenna are on the back of the beetles. And I'm going to show you, if this works, which it never does, that what's happening here is trophallaxis. You see that beetle rubbing its antenna on the bee's mandibles? And you see the bee rubbing the beetle's back? I mean, this bee is completely duped into thinking that she's feeding another bee. And when the beetle's done, she goes back down into the prison. Biologically, it's pretty fascinating. If you look in the background, you'll see that there's another bee addressing a beetle that you can't see. You got to use your imagination caps here. I'm going to show you again. And basically what happened, there's a beetle behind that beetle that's coming up. That's, the bee's not having any of that. She's chasing that beetle back and forth, and you can see it. So you've got one in the foreground feeding, and the other back there attacking the beetle. Do you see it? All right. Fascinating, right? But this was done in Africa. Well, guess what? It's done in Georgia, too. I saw European bees doing this same thing. So the behavior doesn't seem to lie with the bees. It seems to lie with the beetles, just the ability to do this. So I want you to think about everything we're seeing here. This is what you're up against, something that has really integrated well into a honeybee colony. The thing that this reminds me of a lot is a Brawla, the wingless fly, Brawla cica, right? It lives on bees' heads, and when, it's, when two bees are feeding one another, that Brawla will come down and eat, or there's some evidence that the Brawla can use its kind of feet to scrape the bees and cause the bees to regurgitate honey too. So I'm going, this is important to think about because I'm transitioning away from small hive beetles are a problem to something interesting about them, then back to small hive beetles are a problem. So if I had been a good PhD student, I would have known that this behavior is not unique in the insect world. It is fairly common for things that live in social insect colonies to have an assortment of behaviors 
that allow them to integrate successfully into their host nest. You're looking, for example, at Amphotus marginata. This is another beetle, a nitidulid beetle, no less, clubbed antenna, who actually lives in ant colonies and can do the same thing with ants that small hive beetles can do to bees. It can coerce the ants into regurgitating food while it sits there and feeds. So this trait is present in multiple species of nitidulid, especially ones that live in social insect colonies. Fascinating development for them to be able to do this. Now, again, this is the science part of my talk, so just bear with me. We'll, we'll get back to the let's kill them part of my talk. Um, this is really what fascinates me. If, if, I, if, I had, if I had a lot of money and, all, and I could do all that I wanted to do, I'd do honeybee ecology and conservation exclusively. And one of the questions that I would answer would be, how does this trophallactic interaction happen? Let's think about this prisoning thing. What's going on there? All of these kinds of things. But I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of social insect symbionts. How many of you hate the pest that kill our honeybee colonies? It's okay to raise your hand. It's the, it's the interactive part of the... I, I forget who it was. You're probably in the room. They said, you know, if, Jamie, if you're looking for interaction for, from the crowd, British people don't usually interact with their audience. So, man, so, but it was a British person who told me that, so it's okay. I'm just kidding. So, All right, so it's, it's funny because I'm, if you, yeah, we hate our pests. We hate the two wax moth species. We hate tracheomites. We hate varroa. Brawla is a novelty, but it's cute, so we don't mind it so much. But, but we think, oh, these five things are terrible. Let me tell you, if you were an ant keeper, you'd have a much bigger problem because they literally have hundreds or thousands of things that live in their nest. New World Army ants alone have over 10,000 species of arthropods that live in their nest and have these complicated relationships. So in the grand scheme of things, bees are remarkably good at keeping things out of their nest. So the only way to be able to study it is look at the things that have beat these defenses, right? The only way to study these behaviors is look at something that's overcome them so that you can see what happens. Well, in order to live in a social insect colony, you have to do one of three things or some combination thereof, all right? You have to have some sort of behavioral traits that allow you to integrate, some sort of chemical traits that allow you to integrate, or some sort of morphological traits. So, for example, a behavioral trait. The beetles are able to do turtling, which is the behavior where they can completely pull their appendages up under their bodies. They turn their back to bees, and the bees can't do anything about it. They try to bite them and grasp them, but they can't get through the shell. We know they hide, but clearly one of the things that they do well is they have this begging, begging mimicry, something that causes the bees to feed them, right? Wouldn't you argue that they have a behavioral adaptation that allows them to integrate successfully into the nest. I mean, arguably, if they couldn't do this, they'd be confined forever until they just died. And what we believe goes on here is this dynamics where under most circumstances, a normal colony can keep these beetles at the periphery of the nest. And when the colony gets stressed in any way, these things break prisons and go in and just cause problems. We also suspect even at low populations, the beetles are just cryptically reproducing at very low levels all the time. It's very common for me to get beekeepers in the states to say, I've got adult beetles, but I don't have larvae, so I don't have any problems. And I say, you've got adult beetles and you got larvae, moron, because where do you think the adults came from? Clearly I'm not that mean, but you get the point. So my, my point is, is they're reproducing even if you don't see them in the nest, right? So that's what's happening here. And so we know that there's this low-level reproduction, but when something happens to the nest and these things break free, all bets are off. They start reproducing in large numbers and colonies begin to collapse. So that's some of the behavioral things they do. Let's talk about some of the chemical things they do. I have a colleague who believes that he has found compelling evidence that these small hive beetles are associated with a yeast. And when this yeast is deposited on pollen, it produces honeybee alarm pheromone. All right, when the yeast is deposited on pollen, the yeast produces honeybee alarm pheromone. And then subsequently, guess what he showed small hive beetles are remarkably attracted to? Honeybee alarm pheromone. So he believes that this is part of that dynamic where beetles break free of the prisons, access the vulnerable parts of the nest, the vulnerable parts of the nest. This stuff is deposited by them just being there. And as a result, the colony is starting to crank out 
these pheromonal bouquets that are attractive to other beetles, which calls the party into here, and let's finish it off, finish off the job, right? There's a lot that we don't know. I'm not going to take those major steps with him yet, but what I will say is that there's compelling evidence that there is some chemical mimicry in some way or chemical use that the beetles are able to employ in order to integrate into honeybee colonies. Remember, behavioral ways, chemical ways, or morphological ways. A lot of things that live with social insects look like social insects, the things that they're living with, or they're built like army tanks and nothing can happen to them. That's your two options. You either look like your host or you're impenetrable to your host. Small hive beetles are the latter, right? Their exoskeletons are very hard, very slippery. Bees have a hard time grasping them. They can't sting through them. As I shared, the small hive beetle can just turn their back to the bee and the bee can't get them. But they also have physical adaptations that make them really hard for bees to deal with. You're looking at the leg of a small hive beetle. Now this may not be so amazing to you, but there's a huge groove there which clearly fac facilitates the complete retraction of the appendages up under the body. But there's also all of these hairs on what we will call the, the beetle's foot for the sake of calling beetle parts something. So these, these hairs, well, this is a cousin of the small, uh, small hive beetle. Like I said, low biopa, I've already introduced you to this. If you compare the small hive beetle's groove to one of its cousins that doesn't live in social insect colonies, you can see it's largely missing here. You can see those hair-like, finger-like appendages on the beetle foot is largely missing. We were able to do this with small hive beetles and a lot of its relatives, and sure enough, you see a pattern. Things that live with social insects have deep grooves and lots of hairs, and things that don't, don't. So you say, why are the hairs important? I'm glad you asked that question, because I'm going to tell you. This is Hemispherata cyena. It lives with an ant. So it's built like an army tank, clearly. The interesting thing about this, here's the ants it lives with. If you put some oil on its feet and allow it to walk over a sheet of glass, this is that beetle's normal footprint. If while it's walking over that sheet of glass, you disturb it like a paintbrush in its way, this becomes its footprint. And so what it's doing is it's putting those hair-like appendages on the surface to increase its surface contact so that the host can't flip it over. And you say, that's absurd. That would never work. I submit to you, it's pretty daggum good. When you don't do anything, when, this is the disturbance. If you did not use the paintbrush and you drop the pulley, the beetle goes, wee! But if you have a disturbance, in this case the paintbrush, and drop the pulley, the beetle's able to hold that weight because of those increased surface contact with, with what it's walking on. That's how beautiful life is. Because small high beetles have this. They have the ability to anchor down, retract those appendages, anchor down on the surface, and it's just hard for those, beetle, those bees to get them flipped. Pretty amazing, isn't it? That's what you're up against, right? There's so much going on that you're trying to beat. All right, so you can see again the small high beetles, blah, blah, blah. Now the part that you probably wanted to hear in the first place. How do we kill them? Well, good luck. <laughs> um, well, my wife wanted to see Titanic years ago. I was like, why would you want to see that? We know what happens. The boat sinks. And if you haven't seen Titanic, I'm sorry for telling you that. <laughs> and it's like going to see Romeo and Juliet. I mean, they both die. How terrible can it be? Sorry if you haven't seen that. I've just ruined it for you. Well, I've just told you the ending of this lecture. It's not easy to kill them, but I think, personally, I think that's a good thing. And I'll tell you why momentarily. I think it's the beginning of a good thing. I don't think it, in and of itself it's a good thing. So, we are humans, right? Most of us, right? <laughs> and when we get exposed to critters, we just want to develop a chemical, expose it to that critter, and annihilate it. That's what we do. And in bee colonies in the States, we get small hive beetles, all of these things. We're going into colonies to kill small hive beetles. This is uh, Checkmite Plus, the active ingredient is Kumafos. If you cut a strip in half, put it under a piece of cardboard, slide it strip side down on the bottom board of a colony, the beetles will hide up under it. 
get exposed to the strip and die. The problem is it doesn't do a very good job. It's great at killing beetles. You just It's hard to get enough of them down there to cause the problem. This is Guard Star, permethrin. It's a ground drench. You mix it with water and saturate your apiary with it so that when beetle larvae go into the soil, they have to crawl through poison to get there. It's expensive. You have to apply it multiple times after rains, etc. All of this to say, these things surely will kill beetles if they contact it. The problem is, the, it's not as easy as the old apistan strip for Varroa, where you put them in and they just die. This requires a lot of effort and planning, etc. So in my opinion, it's good that these haven't been so great, because that's forced us to look for non-chemical ways to control small hive beetles. So I'll share some examples with you. First things first, you're almost certainly going to hear when it comes to small hive beetles, trap them. Sorry, trap them. I'm, I'm using my southern colloquialisms. Trap them. Trap them, trap them, trap them, trap them. And if you go to any beekeeping equipment supply manufacturer in the U.S., there's a thousand and one traps. Nope, nope, there's a thousand and two traps. There's a zillion of them. All of them probably trap beetles. I, I'm not showing you these to advocate these. I'm showing you these because these are just two types of traps. This one's not even used. But this is called the hood beetle trap. And everybody and their brother has looked at attractants for small hive beetles. And they've looked at everything from stale beer to pollen dough inoculated with that yeast, etc. But at the end of the day, apple cider vinegar is as good as anything else that they can put in. A, is that what you call it? Good. I was afraid I said something you didn't know. There's all the, the, what is he talking about stare. The thing is, is apple cider vinegar doesn't kill them. So beetles can go into it and come back out. So one of the neat things about this hood trap is it's got three compartments. You can put cider vinegar in the first one and then mineral oil in the other two. And so two-thirds of the time the beetle are going to go into the killing agent while being attracted to the good smelling agent. So apple cider vinegar works. It works pretty well. There's all kinds of deviations from this basic trap design. Some of the more popular ones now are like AJ's Beetle Eater or the Beetle Blaster, etc. Small traps that are pretty cheap that fit between the tops of frames that are disposable or reusable depending on how you want to do it. The problem with traps is they don't trap all the beetles and it only takes a male and a female to cause a problem. Right? So really you need to do more than traps. Traps are pretty good at taxing beetle populations but not at eliminating. So we use other things like use good hive equipment. <laughs> so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking American beekeepers are slobs, aren't you? But I will tell you, this is not an American beehive. I was in another country. I won't tell you will where to preserve the integrity of that country. But you can see, if small hive beetles were there, everything about this colony is accessible to small hive beetles. There's a massive crack there and cracks all around the box. It's just impossible for bees to defend. Simple things. Use traps. Use good hive equipment. Don't throw debris combs on the ground in your apiary. Keep your honey houses clean. You know, those kinds of things are very important for beetle control. Don't give beetles other places to reproduce. Our beekeepers have had to learn that they can't take off all the supers and store them in the honey house for two weeks until they begin to extract them. They have to take them off and extract them and take them off and extract them because otherwise you're giving an unprotected reservoir of food for small hive beetles to reproduce in if you leave them in a honey house. So it's those little things that have made a big difference. Small colonies, in this case mating nukes, are just magnets for beetles. We have our biggest beetle problems in our smallest colonies. Small colonies where bees are already stressed for being a small colony, also where bees aren't able to adequately defend all the combs. It's very important because our colonies' populations go up and down and they get strong and weak. And any comb that is unprotected, that has pollen or bee brood, is food for small hive beetles. So we have to condense colonies down as the population shrinks and grow them as they grow. We cannot leave unprotected combs or stressed colonies in apiaries, which is what that says. Incidentally, the number one rule for controlling small hive beetles, keep colonies strong. Control what you can control. Keep them strong. We like to think that small, okay, I'm going to do a trick question here. And every time I warn you that there's trick questions, you miss it. So let's see if we can do better this time. <laughs> How many of you have had a colony killed because of wax moth? 
Oh, you're scared now, aren't you? You don't know what to do. <laughs> well, the general rule of thumb is, is that wax moths don't kill colonies. They're secondary stressors. When they come in, the colony had a problem that you're missing because now the wax moths have taken over. That's not always the case. It's possible for wax moths to take out a colony, but generally speaking, they're just finishing the job. You're missing something else. Well, small hive beetles are like that. They can overcome strong colonies, but they rarely do. They far more often take over weak colonies. So control what you can control, and bees are typically able to handle the issue themselves. With that in mind, you know, control the diseases and pests that you can control, varroa, the foul broods, etc. Keep your colony strong and healthy. I did a lot of work with potential genetic control of small hive beetles. It's like anything else in life. When you study it for so long and it no longer becomes a problem, it's hard to stay motivated to continue to study it. But I'd gotten pretty far in this line of work. This is a picture you'd already seen earlier, right? But I was also able to show that small hive beetle females can go into a brood comb where there is an empty cell and there's brood all around it. How many cells is an empty cell bordered by? Six. So if there's cat brood all the way around, she would actually go and bite holes in the walls of the cell and stick in her ovipositor and lay eggs beside the developing brood. So in one cell surrounded by cat brood, she could lay eggs in six different cells. Now, the beauty of science is that it's not so amazingly difficult as most people think. I want you to watch how this happened. Wow, small hive beetles lay eggs and brood. Hey, wait a minute. Bees have hygienic behavior and can detect problems in brood and remove the brood. Hey, maybe they can do the same thing for beetle eggs. Did you just see how science happened? That's it. If you can do that, you can be a scientist. Congratulations. Well, that's what I did. I said, maybe, maybe, since we have hygienic behavior for other things, there's an, a reason to believe that they can detect beetle eggs or young beetle larvae and brood and deal with it appropriately. So, sure enough, I find evidence for that. And that's what's happening here. The bees are removing the prepupae. So I developed a really simple bioassay where we have a cage that has small high beetles in it and a cage that does not. I put that in a colony for 24 hours and allow the beetles to oviposit in cells unrestricted. So I remove the cages and you can see what's happened. Beetles, no beetles. Then you put a sheet of plastic over the top of that comb and you mark everywhere that has a capping with a hole in top. Because that tells me that beetles potentially laid eggs in there. So I mark all of those cells today, take the plastic off, put the frame in the hive for 24 hours, take it out, put the sheet of plastic right back on top, and I can see the cells I marked yesterday that are no longer there today. If I marked 100 yesterday and the bees removed 50 of them, they're 50% hygienic. If I marked 100 yesterday and they removed 100 of them, they're 100% hygienic. You get the drift? And so that's the idea. Is we did a lot of work on that, and sure enough, we found a whole range of hygienic responses by colonies towards beetles in their brood. Some were really good at finding them and removing them. Some were really bad. So if I were de developing a breeding program around this idea, guess which ones I would select for? The ones that are really good at removing it. So again, I sort of abandoned this work because it's not so useful anymore where I am. There are other things that are more important, but I have a sneaky suspicion it's about to pick up again. Probably not by me, though, but by someone else, surely. So that's potential genetic responses, right? Breeding bees to do things. I also like the idea of biological control. How many of you know what that is? It's real simple. Everything that's alive has something that eats it or makes it sick. When I was in South Africa, when I was in South Africa, so my academic history is I have a, a bachelor's in biology from the University of Georgia and a PhD in entomology from South Africa. Halfway through my PhD, I came home, got married to my sweetheart, and brought her back to South Africa with me, and I finished my PhD while she did her master's. So her undergrad and master's are both in wildlife biology. Her, her PhD is in pollination ecology. That's unimportant. But her undergrad degrees are, are wildlife biology, etc. And 
we, we were out, my wife refused, I'm sorry, this is going to hurt your feelings, but my wife refused to learn how to drive on the wrong side of the road when we lived in South Africa. <laughs> and I said, how can it be the wrong side of the road? I said, well, Americans and Germans invented cars, right? So we get to determine which side of the road is the right side. <laughs> Ain't that right, Nico? <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. All right, so getting back to the story before you guys do something to me. We were out in the bush because I had to drive my wife to the, to, she refused to learn, we call it a stick, I think you call it a manual, something like that. So she refused how to learn how to drive a stick and refused to learn how to drive on the left side of the road. So I had to drive her to all her sights. And we were out in the field one day and I was walking along, you, you might find this hard to imagine, but I talk a lot. And so <laughs> I was, it was me, it was me and my, my, a game ranger went out with us this time. Game rangers all want to go out with you until they do science. And I got news for you. Science is fun. We talk about it, but it is boring sometimes. And her particular research project, I'm totally chasing a rabbit here, but her particular research project is she wanted to be able to estimate ungulate populations, the big kudu and bushbuck and dica, et cetera, in the bush by counting their piles of poo. <laughs> So we would go along these animal trails and count piles of scat or feces, let's put it that way. Well, we were out walking one time, and this guy goes with us, and he grabs me by the shoulder and says, Jamie. I said, yes. He said, there's a lion nearby. I said, there's no lion nearby. And right at the time, I heard something that sounded like thunder. And, and my stomach, you know how they say your stomach like drops, and it, it totally happened. <laughs> And so, so I, I, I thought it was so deep and loud, I thought it was a black rhinoceros. So I'm looking around for this, and all of a sudden, right in front of me, like five yards away, I see a tail moving in the bush. I can't see the beast, I can see the tail. So I've, I'm like, I'm dead. My wife's dead. I was like, wait a minute, I'm the fastest one of the three of us. I'm okay. These two suckers are in trouble. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you the story to say everything that exists has something that will eat it or make it sick. That's a long story to get you there too, right? Incidentally, I'll tell another quick story. When my wife was, when we were coming back to the States, she wanted to do a PhD and I said, honey, you just need to study um, ornithology. She said, why? I said, it'd be great to travel the world being world experts on the birds and the bees. <laughs> really, that's all I get? <laughs> do you not call it the same thing we do? Did you miss the joke? Anyway. Back to what I'm supposed to be talking about. All right, so what you're looking at is, it's, in the States, it's called a catawba worm. People plant catawba trees in their yard in the southeast because they know these caterpillars are going to show up. And why do they want these caterpillars? Because they go fishing with them. It's really weird. It's gross. They cut off the heads and turn the body inside out and fish. It's whatever it is. Okay. So one day I was out at the research unit. There was a catawba worm that had all of these white things on it. And what these white things are, are they're cocoons from a parasitic wasp. There is a wasp who stung that catawba worm and laid its eggs on the inside. The larvae then go and eat the inside of that caterpillar alive. And when they're done, they burst out of their body and spin cocoons. And you get this. You can see the catawba worm is dead. And all of these cocoons are open because these wasps have gone on to find more catawba worms. So if I want to control catawba worms... I would just rear up a bunch of these wasps and release them and see what happens. That's the premise of biological control. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you rear up something that shouldn't be eating what it's eating. And that can be a problem. So you have to make sure it's specific to what you're going after, etc. So I said probably a vulnerable stage for small high beetles is when they're in the soil. And there's a couple of things we know that do well in the soil. Fungal diseases and nematodes. So I found a fungus that wiped it. In fact, the re how I found this is that my, my rearing populations of small high beetles were being wiped out. I was just having a hard time reusing the soil. And what I found is this fungus that was just wiping them out. So I said, this would be a great biological control. And I sent it off, and it came back. One species was Aspergillus flavus, and the other species were Aspergillus niger. And what's the problem with using these two? They call stone brood in bees, right? So I don't want to rear something and release it that might hurt our bees. But I also said nematodes. There are nematodes. Now listen, I know what you're thinking. Nematodes. Everybody says, no, wait a minute. If I put nematodes out, they're going to eat my tomatoes or tomatoes. I'm sorry. So, and they're going to do all these things to my plants, and I'm going to have such a hard time. But listen, there are nematodes that eat plants. There are nematodes that eat people. There are nematodes that eat insects. 
The ones that eat insects are called entomopathogenic nematodes, insect-eating nematodes, right? And more specific, you can find nematodes that eat beetles or whatever, whatever. And sure enough, there were some native nematode species in the southeastern U.S. that were shown to eat beetles. And what they do is there's two types. There's an ambush species that we tested where the beetle larvae crawls through the soil and it wanders by a nematode and the nematode attacks it. Or there's the heat-seeking missile nematode where the beetle larvae are in the soil becoming pupa and the nematodes are going after it. How the nematodes kill the beetles is even better than how the wasp kills the caterpillar. I should have given this talk yesterday because this is straight out of a Halloween story. What happens is these nematodes will go into the body of the developing beetle. They'll regurgitate bacteria. The bacteria will digest. They'll turn the inside of that beetle to slop. They'll produce a toxin that kills the beetle, and the nematodes just slurp up the juice, right? Amazing. Life is amazing. So a few nematodes go in, hundreds or maybe thousands of nematodes come out. So the idea of biological control is you release a living organism that goes on to continue to be a problem. So we were getting really good control in very controlled studies with these nematodes. And again, when beetles cease to be a big problem for our beekeepers, we just sort of abandon it. The good news about the nematodes we were using, hetero Heterorhabditica indica and Steinonema rea bravi, and I know you wanted to know those two names, were native to the southeast. The good thing is, is it's not like I had to import a new nematode to cause a problem. So what we would be doing is just augmenting their populations to control beetles. So those are all things that easily others can do with nematodes in their areas or with hygienic behavior in their areas to try to get a handle on small hive beetles. So if that's not an option, you're going to have to resort to strong colonies, good management, good hygiene, and some of these non-chemical methods that I keep talking about on and on and on. Maybe biological control or genetic control, breeding bees, might be a good option for you. Again, that's all for you to decide, right? The political structure under which you work. But I will say, if this is any consolation or any feel-good news, we've had it since 1996 at least. It's almost 20 years now, and I don't want to suggest to you it's an afterthought, but I will suggest to you that it's not in our top five, of th five things that we worry about, maybe not even in our top ten. So, another thing I'll point out before I close for questions. A lot of people say, what did you do? Because clearly when the beetles were first there, it was a big problem. It was. But I'm convinced that over time, we change our practices in a way that helps bees get better when we may not be conscious of what we're doing. Let me give you an example. How many of you hate being stung? Touche. You learn how not to get stung when you quit wearing gloves. Because you learn what makes bees mad, and over time, you subconsciously adjust your management and movements to minimize bee defensive behavior. So it's not like you could pinpoint 10 years later for why you're getting fewer stings, when in reality, you've just changed gradually. And I'm convinced after 20 years, we've changed gradually how we do things where we can't pinpoint any one thing that we've done that solved the problem, but whereas it's collectively a, a, a new system of management, a new approach to how we do things that may have just happened out of just trial and error. There are some fantastic documents extension documents written in this, from the states on how to control small hive beetles. Fantastic ones. Freely downloadable from the internet. In fact, if you coerce, it, it, instead of all of you emailing me, if you coerce your club president to email me, I'll develop a list. Email that list to your club president and he or she can circulate it among the members. There's videos online, great documents on how to deal with it involving traps and a lot of the stuff I've talked about. I say all that to say there's tons of information out there. There will probably be small high beetle workshops in Europe. In fact, I know the International Bee Research Association is talking about putting one together in spring. There's going to be a lot going on. But I just, I don't want to stand here and tell you it will not be a problem for you. The other thing that you've got going for you is that you're not sunny South Florida. I know that life is a matter of perspective and maybe you wish that you were, but I will tell you that we have small high beetles in every state in the United States and only people in the South complain about them. And that's because they just don't do well 
in cold climates. They survive, but they don't thrive. So their populations take a significant hit over winter, and it really takes time for them to regain strength. So whereas the average North, the average North North American, i.e. Yankee, <laughs> will talk about losing the colony here or there. Incidentally, when I lived in South Africa, they, they probably like, I don't know what, you probably do this too, I, I'm guessing it's where the South Africans got, they'd call me Yank. I'm like, that's a double insult. Number one, you're calling me a Yank because that's your slang for American. But number two, it's a northern North American. It's like southerners do not want to be called Yankees. Anyway, so it's a joke. I'm overplaying it, but not really. All right, so, so, so I will tell you that the northern United States people don't, they talk about losing a colony. We lose apiaries. And so it's just not comparable. And I don't think your climate is so conducive. Life has an amazing way of adjusting, though, so anything is possible. I wouldn't tell you today that you're not going to have a problem. I just suspect it won't be. So this is your goal. Hopefully you'll get there. You're doing pretty good right now since you don't have it. And I'll just ask, <laughs> do you guys have any questions? I don't know what time I'm supposed to stop, but if it's 3.30, I have four minutes. So... Yes, I've heard that um, because of the way they pupate in the ground, that running chickens underneath oh, um, might question. help. Sure. I keep chickens. So, so a comment about running chickens around colonies in order to get rid of beetle larvae. So I know people in the U.S. who do that. It's never been tested, so whether or not it works is debatable, but it's a fun idea, and chickens like to eat things. So I, I know of people who do it. If you wanted to eat a lot of pasta at the moment, you'd go to southern Italy. If they were to ask you over dinner, how would we eradicate this so we don't give it with our queens to the Brits, what would you tell them? Okay, so I'm gonna restate the question. I'm gonna restate the question, and I'm gonna take a long time doing it so that I'm gonna run out of time and I won't have to answer it. <laughs> All right, so here we go. He asked, no, I'm just kidding. So he, he asked me if, if I were taken out to dinner, in other words, not formally in front of a group of people, asked how would, I eradicate the small hive beetle if I had to to keep the Brits from getting quizzes, quote, Brits from getting queens from Italy with small hive beetle issues. All right. All right. So the good news is, in my life, all I have to do is produce the information, and I let the beekeepers and the politicians sort that stuff out. I suspect, and I hate to be on camera to say this because I know it's going to show up on the web, but I suspect they're not going to be able to eradicate it. Because by the time you sh it's showing up in 30 and 40 apiaries, it's in the wild population. So in my opinion, the only way to eradicate it would be to kill every honeybee colony in Italy that's in the area of the small hive beetle, and then some on the perimeter. And to be honest, you're awfully close to Africa. There'll be an introduction tomorrow or an introduction three days from now. And I know we could argue maybe not. It's taken this long. So I'm not sure. It can be eradicated. I know their government's trying hard, and I'm, I'm eager to see how that works for them. I've been told repeatedly that the northern half of the country is colder, perhaps less conducive to beetle issues than the southern half of the country. Um, I know that Canada, I know that the Australians were shipping queens to Canada, and Canada has an awfully uh, limited, has a process that, that, that these queens and bees coming in have to go through in order to be small hive beetle free. I can't remember for the life of me what they are, but my point is that some other countries have already addressed this issue as appropriately as they can, so maybe those standards exist that you guys could borrow for still receiving queens from Italy, but if they go under these certain measures to get to you, that's all for you to debate. I, I just don't know how eradication is possible unless you go after every colony. And then there's suspicions again that they might show up on fruit, so let's say you kill every colony, but they're out there on fruit. I, I, just, I just don't know. Fortunately, I don't have to know, <laughs> but that's a good question. Do you know how he's going into Australia? Pardon? Do you know how he's going into Australia? Great question. So the question was is how did they, they get... They don't have Varroa. Sure. The question was is how did they get into Australia? They don't have Varroa. So I'm, I'm going to address that from the American side first. So some of the places that they showed up initially in the United States were all major port cities. So we suspect that they were coming in 
with swarms, etc., into our ports, potentially. That's, that's that. And so Australia, I believe I've heard the same thing, that they were showing up around Brisbane and places like that that are major port cities showing up. In Italy, my colleague there tells me the apiary was fairly close to a port. So it's likely, maybe in these scenarios, they're coming over boats. You know, as a scientist, I would never say this is how it happened, but it's possible that that's happened. We know with certainty that bees travel as swarms on boats because we get swarms from South America all the time coming into our ports. In fact, that's probably how Florida got Africanized bees. We don't have Africanized bees in the states between the Southwest and Florida. These states don't have Africanized bees. So they probably showed up in our ports. So that's probably the same way with beetles. It's just a guess, but possibly. Other beetle questions, small high beetle questions. I can't answer anything about the BEA tools. That's where you're an expert. No more questions. Woo! Well, I'm officially done, so it's been fantastic to talk to you these four times. I'm traveling the country. I'm going to three more places over the next week, so maybe I'll see you there. So I really appreciate your attention there in these four lectures. Thank you, Thank you so much. much.